I'm curious to know what was your background before getting into crypto? What did you used to do? And maybe in that, what was your journey into getting into crypto and all that? Yeah, for sure. So my undergrad was computer science and in college, and I wanted to be a software engineer, but I was pretty terrible uh, at the beginning. In college, I didn't even know how to type. And eventually I weaseled my way into a role at a hedge fund where I was a software support engineer. So I was basically helping run with something called alpha production, where it's basically all the algorithms, all the models written mostly in Python, but also this really old language called SAS that decide what the hedge fund was going to trade that day. So that was awesome because I got to see kind of end to end uh, how a hedge fund decides what to trade, actually does the trade. I was in charge of the whole process, which was awesome to see. And that's really where I, I cut my teeth, if you will, on Python, uh, on TradFi and finance. And I learned a lot of things about finance or traditional finance working there. Um, I ended up leaving there and working for a, for a short period of time for a data API company. Uh, and then I started working for Chainlink Labs for a few years doing developer advocacy. Uh, and that's obviously where I was deep in Solidity, deep in smart contracts. And then at the beginning of this year, in January, uh, I started Cypherin with some other people and just been full blast on that since. Yeah, cool. That's a nice journey. It goes from like a, like a full stack, like financial switch from the traditional. Yeah. And so what did one decided to go like get into crypto from being the traditional finance did that i imagine that would have a big impact on you to go and do the crypto thing yeah well a, a number of things so when i first heard about smart contracts or excuse me when i first heard about crypto i thought it was kind of a stupid speculative asset uh, or the whole industry yeah. like seriously because like, I, I like many of us i think yeah like right? many of us right like i i was working on a hedge fund and the whole purpose there is like find alpha, find places to invest, etc. And I was like, ah, oh, crypto might be this next cool thing to invest in. So I actually did a couple of research products at the, or we had like FedEx days or like hack, basically like internal hackathons. And I did a bunch like doing crypto trading stuff. And that was a ton of fun. And I went down the rabbit hole, but that's really was, was it. I, th I literally thought it was okay. It was just kind of some silly gamey thing. I, I didn't think it had any intrinsic value. And then somebody reached out to me and said, hey, you want to put data on the blockchain? And I was like, what are you talking about? Why are you putting data on this like weird internet money thing? And they were like, no, you can put data on, onto blockchains. And that's kind of when I was learning about Chainlink and what Chainlink was doing. And then that blew me away. I was like, wait, what programmable money? This is insane. And there, a big piece for me was just curiosity. I was like, what is this new money thing but then as i kind of got deeper and deeper down the the rabbit hole as they say the more i thought whoa this is mind-blowing this is gonna have crazy impacts on everything everything and there's a lot of issues with tradfi that I, I didn't love there's a lot of like information asymmetry that i didn't think was fair uh how retail really gets the short stick and it felt like smart contracts really are this this way to at an infrastructural level level the playing field. And that is incredibly enticing and exciting to me. Uh, and that's why I'm working as hard as I can to bring it to the masses and onboard more people, because I just, I think this is the future of finance. I think this is the way to level the playing field. This is the way to, you know, have a much better, more accountable, fair, uh, economic world. So very, that's how I, that's why I made the switch. Okay. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And speaking of working extremely hard, you have a crazy amount of output, you know, like high quality output. You started uh, Cypherin, you have so many YouTube videos that you put out constantly to educate everyone on like the latest practices. How do you have time to do all this stuff? <laughs> I actually think recently my output's been kind of low. I, this past week I was a little bit sick, but I don't, how do you not be super excited with what we're doing? Uh, to me, that's kind of it. Um, I'm a very all or nothing person. I have a very addictive personality. I really like what we're doing here. It's a, it's not, to me, it's it's both a ton of fun. It's really exciting. Um, I don't know. It, it's just a ton of fun. Like the, the, this this industry is a ton of fun. There's amazing opportunity here. 
and that's that's really it <laughs> that's really it yeah yeah it's just based on like enthusiasm then i guess i yeah you know and, and the other thing is like um part of the reason why you know I, I think making content is really nice is like i actually suck at like so there, there's been um back in march i live streamed doing the beanstalk we, we did an audit with this protocol called beanstalk they're a stable coin and i live streamed maybe 70 percent of it which ended up being like 40 hours of live stream audit and i don't think if that was all I did every day, all day, I would be kind of miserable. Uh, I love making the content around it. I'm much better at like going super ham coding or, or building or researching or whatever, and then spending two days make content of it. Like that's super fun to me. And that kind of, you know, super focused deep work, then you switch to kind of this very creative output. I feel like that is able to recharge me and, and keep me going. Uh, I, it's, it's not for everybody, but for me, it's, it's a lot of fun and I love making, I love coding and building and researching to make content. Like to me, that's super fun and then teach other people and that hopefully onboards other people. And, um, yeah. Yeah. So I think that also though. helps. Yeah. I think that helps solidify your knowledge a lot as well. Right. Cause you do the research and then you can't like re-explain it and redo it in a better yeah. way. Uh, so that probably speeds up your learning process a lot. Yeah. Are you somewhere in the like ADD, HDD spectrum? <laughs> um, I, I have no idea. I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. I, I, well, because I, I have maybe. a friend that like, I have a friend that reminds me of you a lot mm -hmm. and he has the same energy, like, let's go, let's go, let's go. And like, mm -hmm. I know for sure that he, he's on the spectrum. Um, <laughs> maybe. And he's just like, <laughs> is this the same thing? He's just like either he has to be like going all in on something. Mm -hmm. He can't just like sit on the couch and just have a chill time. He's like, nah, let's do something. Let's yeah, go, yeah, let's yeah. go, let's go. Um, so yeah, I, I love that energy. I feel like more people in the world should be like that. Uh, <laughs> definitely not everyone though. Yeah, it's, it's not for everybody. Cause, Cause at the same time, you know, like a lot of people in our industry are introverts and that's great too. Yeah, yeah, we need them. And what is your process for creating those videos and all this content? So, it's almost more of just consistently asking the question, okay, what do we need in this industry? What is something that people want to see, people should see? S a video that I made a couple months ago, it didn't, it didn't do very well view-wise, but it's something that I thought was really important was I, I made a couple of like MEV demos. I had a ton of people ask me, hey, can you do MEV if this? Well, what about if you do this in the comp? Well, what about this? And the answer to all of them was like, yes, you can still do MEV. And I wanted to like show, hey, you know, pretty much no matter what you do in all these weird scenarios, MEV is there and it's trying to steal your funds. So I showed, I really wanted to show, hey, like if you do this, you your money will get stolen. I ended up having to spend, you know, 150 bucks or something to like live on Ethereum, show me getting front run, right? But uh, I really think like seeing is believing but it was really important to me to make that because I wanted to really get across, hey, like, don't send these trans these super sensitive transactions onto a public mempool. But to answer your question, yeah, it's just keep asking that. What do we need? What do we need? What do we need? And one of the biggest answers I always come to the realization is we, we need more education, right? We are, it's 2023 and we are still getting hit by reentrancy attacks. How do I... How do I, and literally I, I look at myself and I go, Patrick, you stupid idiot. What did, why did you not make enough content on like, like seriously, I go, well, you didn't make enough content on this. You haven't told people enough about reentry. Like you need to make a security course. You need to do this, that, the other thing. Anytime an issue happens, I go, why do we not know this? Why did we get hit by this? How do we fix this? Um, a big part of it is education. Another big part is tools. Um, but yeah, seriously, I just keep saying, what, what do we need? What do we need? What do we need? And the answer to that a lot of the times continues to be, we need more education. People just don't know a lot of this stuff. Yeah, it makes sense. But I think one of the downfalls, I mean, not downfall, but like one of the not so great sides of everything being permissionless, permissionless is that anyone can deploy something, right? And sometimes those things end up getting some traction. And in, in other kind of coding, Usually there's not a problem to have like a junior developer deploy something, right? But in Solidity, if you have a junior developer that's 
that that shouldn't be such a thing as a junior developer. Like you should be like already like security minded, like an expert. But we all know that it doesn't work that way. So I think that's that's a gap that we have to work to close faster. And yeah, exactly. The yeah. education side of it is so important. But it's but it's and, but it's almost kind of hilarious because you're like we shouldn't have a junior solidity engineer, but they have to start somewhere. So <laughs> where, yeah, where, where exactly. They, right. Where are yeah. they going to start? So, all right. So yeah. no, no junior solidity engineers. So we're basically saying no new engineers and we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Right. So yeah, yeah, yeah you have exactly. to start somewhere. And, but yeah, like, as you're saying, we need better ways to bridge the gap to making them intermediate. And that was, that was the thought behind, you know, my two previous super long courses was, okay, how do I get them to an intermediate stage? The Foundry one had a much bigger uh, focus on security because it's, to me, it's be, it's almost becoming a prerequisite. Like, yeah, you have to be a security engineer to really be a developer in Web3 because as you're saying, we, it's just such an adversarial environment. Yeah. And, you know, your quality, your content is the best quality content I've seen so far. Well, thank in, you. You know, any kind of Web3 content. And you give it all for free. You know, there's ton of paid courses and stuff around, but yours is just free, despite being the best quality. What is your philosophy behind it? Why are you doing this? Uh, a number of reasons. The the biggest one for me is is yeah, it's just a philosophical one. I don't think knowledge should be paywalled. I I really don't. I mean, this is Web three, right? A big reason why we're doing this is for permissionless access. I don't think knowledge should be paywalled. I think if we want to get anywhere as an industry, we need to, we do not have the luxury of having, you know, a million JavaScript developers already here. We need to bring people to Web3 and we need to lower the barriers to entry as much as possible. Otherwise, we're, we're, we're screwed. We're effed. You know, we, we have a huge uphill battle. We are trying to dethrone a corrupt traditional finance industry that's been around for long, long time. So I, I, we don't have the luxury to be, have these massive paywalls. Um, we need to take every opportunity to get people in this industry as possible. And so that's, that's it from a philosophical standpoint there. I mean, there's a, a lot of other reasons. It's, it's an amazing feeling, you know, looking back now and, and a lot of people reach out to me like, Hey, like you got me into web three and like that feels great. Um, yeah, could I make a lot more money if I slapped a hundred dollar fee on top? Sure, but I think in the long run, it's it's a little bit short sighted. Uh, in the long run, if we bring more people in this industry, I think that'll help me and everyone around much more. So it, to me, it's it's kind of it's more like a long um, yeah. It's it's the raise it's the all the boats. Play. Yeah, exactly. Raise all the boats, right? Like it's a long game play. Um, with the new education site we're coming out with now, we are trying to figure out ways to uh, to monetize it so that I don't have to just uh, throw stuff out for free. Well, so that it, it makes it easier to keep it high quality because it is hard to make something for free and then, um, you know, also keep the lights on and stuff. So uh, we are actually uh, reaching out to sponsors for the upcoming education site, which is phenomenal and they are giving us resources to make this some of the stuff coming down the pipeline is going to be nuts man uh really excited for some of the stuff we're working on but uh that that uh so yeah so like we're, we're figuring out ways to monetize it other ways uh such as with sponsors that will enable us to keep that barrier super low keep the knowledge gate uh the knowledge getting zero and let as many people as possible while also being able to you know keep the lights on keep building keep making it the best as possible and then one other thing, and this is something that I think about a lot, actually, now that we're ranching about education here, a lot of the resources out there, a lot of the content that I make, yes, you know, I take Solidity, I make some fun demo project or whatever, but like, I didn't write the language, I didn't set up the nodes, I didn't, you know, create the best practices, I didn't create open Zeppelin packages, there's all this stuff that I didn't do. And it feels like wrong for me to put a paywall on a lot of this is essentially other people's work. And I kind of just remixed it if like in a way. So I, I've seen something that's really upset me is I've seen courses where they charge some exorbitant fee and it's just like them walking through like, um, like, 
like a website that has like, all right, here's like 10 different attack vectors or something like that. That's really frustrating. But at the same time, you know, if you remix it in a way where it does create a lot of value, you know, it does help people, you know, I do want, I do want people, I do want educators to get paid for their work. I do want them to, you know, be incentivized to create good things. But I also want them, people to do it in a way that uh, makes sense that it's creating more value. Um, but yeah, so for me, it feels weird for me to paywall a lot of other people's stuff sometimes. What about the aspect of if people don't put any money in, they don't really have that sense of commitment and they might be less likely to actually go through the course. You know, that I feel like that is a, a factor that should definitely be considered. I feel like a lot of people, when they don't pay for anything, they just kind of like slack out and that could maybe be a reason why uh, maybe your courses uh, didn't have more effect than what they had. <laughs> what do you think yeah. about that? No, it's it's a good point, actually. Yeah, uh, psychology is weird. Uh, psychology is really weird. Yeah, you, you made a really good point. Like a lot of people see that it's free and they think it's worse, which is crazy, right? Because it's not. <laughs> or yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I think it's very good. I think it's I the mean, best. It, it could be, but it's not. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, this is something actually we're thinking about in upcoming releases where, okay, maybe we keep the whole thing free and then we, cause we want to keep that barrier to entry low and maybe we do like some type of weird add on that where there's a price or we do like, Hey, like stake $10 here and you only get it back if you like mint these NFTs or something like that. There are, that psychology is real and it's like super frustrating because we want to keep the barrier to entry cause they're at the same time. There are a ton of highly motivated people who are do not care, but do not have any money and will do whatever it takes to be successful. And those are the people that, that we really focus. We really, you know, those people are phenomenal. I've met a ton of those people. Um, but you make a good point and we're thinking of ways to target those people as well who want to like throw down a hundred dollars so that they feel like they have to finish. Yeah. I was just playing devil's advocate. Really. I feel like it should be all free. Uh, I'm super. <laughs> Yeah. No, say, say, same page, but but it's funny because you, you bring. We've literally had this conversation where people have not taken our course because they think it's worse, and they go spend you know a hundred dollars on a on, on a course that's actually worse, <laughs> and then come back and they go, oh wow, your course is way better, but I didn't take it because it was free, so I thought it was worse. So we are trying to figure out how to <laughs> how to fix that as well. Yeah, I think a way to go about it you could probably do the certification thing where. Everyone gets access to the course free, but if you want like a NFT to mint that, you know, you actually completed the course and all the exercises, then you have to pay a certain amount. And I think that's, that could be like a good way because for people that are more inclined to pay for the courses, you know, then that gives them like a reason to do it. And for the others that don't really want to pay for it, they can still take it, benefit from it, like, you know, showcase that they've done all the projects in the course or whatever. So at the end of the the day, whoever is hiring them or like whoever they're trying to show this up to can see that they've done the course and they both get the, you know, the most uh, value out of it. Yeah, that, that's an idea that we're, we're definitely thinking about. Cool, cool. And when is the auditing course coming out? Uh, <laughs> after this call, I'm going to get back to work to, uh, to push it out. <laughs> So oh, I'll keep it short then. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, without, without, without giving any specific release dates, we're planning on it being within the next 30 days. Okay. That's a lot sooner than I expected. Cool. <laughs> yeah. To I, see I, it. I gotta get my, my butt in gear. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, I imagine it's a ton of work. The, uh, I've gotten a lot faster. The, 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 oh, I imagine you have. The, the 16 hour one, I did that on weekends. That was like, um, yeah, I did that in my own time. That was on weekends. That took me like four or five months to make. The hard hat one, the 32 hour one took me a solid four months to make. Um, the foundry one was the fastest one. Yeah, that took me only two months, but it's because I'm getting a lot faster. I already, like, I've, you know, I've spent so many hours making these courses that I'm a lot faster at it now. I know I'm very specific with what I I'm doing. I'm using better tools that allow my process to be quicker. So yeah, ho hopefully in the next 30 days, fingers crossed. 
cool cool yeah i, I always wondered how long it took you to make those because they're like really well structured and like really well researched with every single new tool that there is and i wonder like how is your process when you're planning the video like do you have every single little step plan or do you kind of just like build the first one and then you like kind of have to try to build on top of it? How does that work in your head? Yeah, great question. So uh, I start with an outline. I say, okay, what are the things that I want to teach and who do I want to teach it to? So for the Foundry course, for example, I said, okay, who's my first off, who's my target audience? Okay, my target audience is somebody who knows nothing and is coming into Web3. Or my target audience is someone maybe a beginner, Solidity engineer, and they want to become better, right? So that's, first off, who is your target audience? Know exactly what their knowledge is so that you can fill in the gaps where it's not. And then I create my outline. Okay, here's what I want to teach you. So for the founder course, it was, okay, we want to do a starter project where it's going to be types, functions, contracts, blah, blah, blah. Okay, then after that, we're going to take a break. Then we're going to go to, we're going to get a little bit more advanced. We're going to do imports, interfaces, um, cross contract calls. Great. We're going to take a break and you just keep building. You keep building and you have, you create this outline of literally everything you want to teach. You don't create a script or anything though. Otherwise you're never going to get anything done, but you just say, okay, here are all the things that I want to, um, cover and you go over it, you go over it, you go over it until, okay, I have everything in the process of actually filming and actually creating it though, while I'm like filming, while I'm creating it the whole time, I'm like, okay, what is, what is the student thinking about? What is the student uh, uh, hearing? What what are they? What questions are they asking? And then I try to anticipate pitfalls, and that's really important. Is okay. What problems are they going to run into as you're filming it? And then those that's usually what makes the process the longest. Is I have to like keep adding stuff to my course to like oh crap I haven't explained how to install Foundry for Windows users. Okay, let me go get my Windows machine. Let me, let me see if it's the same. Oh crap. They don't know. They're, they're probably using a Windows shell. I don't want them to do that. I want them to use a, a Linux shell. Okay. Let me explain what WSL is and, and do that. Okay, cool. All right. Now they're going to clone some stuff from Git. Ah, oh, crap. I haven't explained Git. Okay. Well, here's Git, here's GitHub and you have to keep doing that. And that's what kind of makes it a little bit longer is all these component skills. Um, but that's, that's basically the process. Okay. What do I want to teach? Who's the target audience? Let's create this outline. Um, and then I write the code and then I film and then that's pretty much it. Yeah. Uh, and then, and, and then one, one other thing. So the, the other thing that makes it kind of easy though, is, you know, I work in this industry. Um, I'm, it's, it's not like, I'm not like researching what are the best tools for the video. I'm researching what are the best tools like for my day to day work. And then I'm kind of taking all the stuff that I'm, that I'm doing and this kind of consistent quest for best practices. And, and then I put that in the video. So, um, as for security, you know, it's been a lot easier because we do smart contract audits, right? So it's like literally, okay, what are we doing? How do we push the envelope? How do we use the best tools in the space? What are the other best people in the space doing? And it's really just kind of like, what is the research that we do day to day? Now let's teach that. Let's teach the best practices to, you know, the new person coming in. If I, the, the question I'll ask too is if I were to hire somebody right now, what are the, what is the floor of skills that I want them to have? What is like the floor of skills for somebody who is really good in this industry? Yeah, that brings me to another question I wanted to ask if someone is looking to get hired at Cyphering, what, what do you guys look for? What does a person look like to you? Like, what can they do to kind of be on a radar and look like a, a good hire? Right now? I mean, I don't know if you guys are hiring right now, but <laughs> at any point in time, like, yeah. you know, any smart contract auditor. So we're not hiring right now. Um, but for, let's, let's talk, I'm assuming we're talking about security people. So let's talk about security engineers in particular. For security engineers, it's, it's a number of things. It's number one, do we vibe? Do we have good chemistry, which I know that sounds weird, but that's important. Do we vibe? Does the person have a great competitive audit track record? That's really something that we look at. So we would, we would go to like Codox or something. Hey, where are you at? How have you been doing in Codox competitive audits? You don't have to be winning them all, 
right? Because, you know, maybe somebody found some super weird, unique medium or something that made them get a bunch of money. But um, we, we've actually been on Code Hawks, we've been doing this thing where we give out experience and you give out experience just based off of like highs and mediums. And we've been finding that there's a lot of people who don't maybe don't find unique a lot of the weird unique edge cases but they find most of like the highs and mediums and those are people who would make phenomenal private auditors right because they're they're getting done what needs to get done and maybe like the weird unique edge case that pays out all the money maybe they miss that but um you know maybe it's just like a weird freeze fund or something in any case there, there's lots of things to think about yeah do we vibe how are they doing in uh, on the code hawks or competitive audit platforms. Um, what's their approach? You know, do they understand a lot of the fundamentals of, of security? Like, do they understand what properties are, what invariant tests are? Are they good at writing proof of concepts? Are they good at writing proof of codes? What's their approach to attacking a contract? There's just kind of a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, qualitative stuff that we take in consideration when we're hiring a security engineer. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And before we, I want to get into code hawks, but before we do that, you seem like you already had your plate pretty full with, uh, you know, Chainlink and creating all those educational videos. Why did you decide to start a auditing firm? And then on top of that, why did you decide to start a constant platform? Great question. Yeah. It goes back to the same question that we've been asking the whole time. The same question we've been asking is, what do we need? What do we need Web3? This is an amazing industry. What do we need? What do we need that's not happening? And I found myself at Chainlink Labs consistently whining about like, oh my God, like why is X getting hacked? Why is Y getting hacked? Why did we get hit with $3.1 billion in DeFi hacks in 20, last year, in 2022? Why? Oh, this sucks. Can somebody do something? And then it finally reached a point where I was like, shit, this is, I have to jump in. I have to jump in because this is still happening. So somebody's doing something wrong for us to keep getting hacked. And if I ask the question, what is, what is some, one of the biggest hurdles to adoption of Web3? What is, what is the biggest hurdle to adoption? I would say the fact, well, I would say two of them. Number one, we still have a horrible PR issue right now with all the scams and stuff running around. But number two, even if we fixed all the scams, we have all these hacks that happen and that's just unacceptable, right? If, if a hedge fund wanted to come to Web3, said, hey, we have a billion dollars, we're looking to diversify it, we wanna park it somewhere in DeFi. And then they look at the stats of DeFi, they will never put that money in, in DeFi, never. So for the time being, DeFi is gonna be a bunch of risky, speculative investors, right? And that's how it's gonna be for some time until we fix this issue. And uh, so then I asked myself, okay, is this something I can help with? And I say the answer is yes. How? Okay, number one, um, we're going to do security. We're going to do smart contract audits. And we said, this is great. This is helpful. Uh, and this is what we started with, just really just kind of get the ball rolling. Uh, we started Cyphering back in December, or excuse me, back in January of this year. And we said, okay, let's, let's start helping with security. Let's do smart contract audits. We learned very quickly that uh, it, it scales very poorly, right? If we want to help the space succeed and we want to help every single protocol, then we would just need to hire and train a ton of auditors to do this, right? And so that's, that's very difficult to do that as a single firm. However, it is much easier to do that as an educational company, right? So we said, okay, let's, uh, let's iterate and go further. So let's, let's give people a platform to test their skills out. And that's why we launched CodeHawks. We said, okay, competitive audits have phenomenal results. There's a number of things in the competitive audit, audit industry that uh, we think they haven't quite gotten right. So we want to we want to launch and do one the way we, we like to see it. We want to get more eyes in the competitive audit industry. So we launched Code Hawks. Uh, we're in the process of launching these educational courses where we can do exactly what we're talking about here, where we can scale security much better. So for us, it kind of goes back to, okay, what do we need? 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 And just, we, we want to keep asking that question. What do we need at Web3, right? We need more education. People are still getting hit by re-entry attacks. Uh, I, I think I made this joke already, but like, what the hell? 
why why are we like patrick why have you not made enough content to stop this from happening like seriously like it's like 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 so so it's like how do we get it so that every single person every single person in web3 knows what properties of the system are knows what a fuzz test is knows what a reentrancy attack is knows you know not to use the reserves of a freaking amm as an oracle right like how do we how do we get this across right and it's drilling people with education uh, having all these making more available all these platforms for people to make money for people to learn about security learn about education and so that's just the question we constantly ask what can we do to make web3 better uh, and so you said, hey, like, why did you launch an audits company? I would argue we're not an audits company. We're, we're a Web3 security company. We're a Web3 education company. Uh, we are teaching people how to write better, more secure contracts uh, through any of our, our platforms and tools. You know, like Solidit, another, another one, right? Like it's, why would we make a tool that helps other competitive auditors? Why would we do that? Because we want to scale the security of Web3. We want to, we want to make everyone better. So that, that's the, that's the rant there. Yeah, that's a nice rant. Um, on building on that rant, you mentioned that you saw some short comments in the current other, uh, auditing constant platforms. So can you speak about like some of those short comments and what do you think they were missing and what is that differentiates Cohox? Yeah. So, so maybe, maybe, um, shortcomings is maybe the wrong term, but you know, you know just, we, we wanted to do it a little bit differently. Yeah, every, every platform has their different, uh, their different agenda. When we first wanted to launch Codox, we wanted to, uh, at an infrastructural level, make sure there was no bias. So we launched with anonymous judging, um, whatever initial results were revealed, we quickly decided, okay, we don't wanna talk about any, uh, any pricing, because it's very frustrating to say, hey, you're gonna win $1,000, and then like the appeal is finished and it's like, just kidding, it's just five, like that really sucks. So we said, we didn't want to do that. Um, there is, uh, there were thoughts about, okay, we don't want to, we don't want to launch with the token. Um, there's just a lot of, a lot of different ways to do the competitive audits platform. And we wanted to do it the way that we wanted to do it, right? So uh, I would say different is, is probably better, um, but those are some of the ways that we launched that we wanted to differentiate and just continue to, give feedback and educate all these competitive auditors, all these security researchers to make them better and better and give them every chance to do so. And I know that running those kind of platforms can be very challenging. There's a, a lot of fires to put out all the time. What are the, being the biggest challenges of running this kind of platform that you found so far? Yeah, so judging was one that we definitely underestimated, uh, or I definitely underestimated. I think so. So a, a lot of the um, a lot of the Cyphern team, security researchers, they are just absolute beast competitive auditors. Obviously, fantastic private auditors as well, or traditional auditors, or security researchers. Excuse me. And uh, judging was one of the ones that takes it takes a lot longer and is a lot harder um, than I originally anticipated. So we had. Um, we, we've had in the books for some time uh, some plans on how to do a couple of new things. And it's taken us a lot longer to roll them out because in practice, it's very difficult to gamify judging in a way that makes sense. So that, so we had to, so we did, um, so we did kind of a more traditional judging to, to start where we had somebody come in somebody do, you know, somebody, uh, a judge who's not doing the competition actually judge, uh, which has been working. Okay. Um, and we've been, uh, fixing a lot of the, uh, standards, uh, recently, which has actually been phenomenal to see. Um, oh yeah. And then actually another, another big thing about Codex, we recently launched on platform judging, um, which is really exciting. So we're not using like GitHub to judge or anything. Uh, we're not using an, uh, an Accenture or everything. Everything's going to be on um, everything's going to be on the, so our ditto valor, di, excuse me, our ditto ETH contest is wrapping up right now. All the judging is happening on the Codex platform, which is crazy exciting. So hopefully it's going to make the lives of judges a lot easier. And it's going to allow us to run a lot of our AI bots, our AI tools to help auto do some of the auto judging. Cause judging with AI is actually a lot easier than 
auditing with AI. So hopefully we're going to be able to use AI a little bit better uh, for the judging process too. But yeah, that, that but that that would be the hardest the hardest piece I think is is judging is the hardest part. Yeah, I I imagine it would be so. Um, it's just something that's so hard is KO. But you mentioned that you're not using GitHub, you auditing it like internally or natively in the platform. What are some of the benefits of doing doing it that way? Because in you know you can like GitHub is its way like already a tool made that's probably like really good for for doing it already. So what's the point of kind of rebuilding the wheel and doing it natively? I would you you can actually do a lot of features a lot easier in the app, right? For so excuse me on your own app. So for example after people submit their issues, instead of GitHub as a very specific way, you can uh, um, showcase them and tag them and et cetera. Uh, so then it goes, okay, well, how do you group issues quickly? How can you see like what the groups are, like what the different findings are very quickly, very easily? GitHub uses tags. Uh, when you're judging, how do you know to, to group what all the tags are? Uh, and in platform, you can make that UX just a lot easier and you can just hyper focus it for judging. And also you can run, um, you run a lot of our scripts a, little, a lot easier. GitHub has a lot of rate limiting stuff. So if you have a comp contest with like 2000, 2000 submissions or something, you have to wait a couple hours to run all your scripts to like format everything. So you can do stuff a lot quicker. So there's a lot of advantage that we've been finding on, on doing it in the platform itself. I see, I see. And regarding to using AI to help judging, if not careful, that could backfire very easily, right? You can like misjudge some, um, you know, high findings or just entirely dismiss a lot of findings that I should be looking to more carefully. Is it hard to strike a, a balance? What is the process of trying to find a, a good middle ground, like a good um, hit and miss ratio? And Great how question. do you keep iterating on that? Because I imagine that, you know, it's not static. You always have to keep looking into it. That seems like it would be very challenging in its own right. Yeah, great question. So right now, all of the AI is more of suggestions. And then a human still has to make the call, right? So the AI isn't doing auto judging. It's really just auto suggestions, and which have been helpful. Right? It does make it easier when an AI just kind of does this process of looking at all the submissions and kind of grouping them for you. And then you go, oh yeah, AI was right or no AI was wrong. But I would argue this is kind of the same as like rolling out a self-driving car, right? You only roll it out once the performance is better than that of a human being. Because human beings at the same time make mistakes. So we actually live streamed the judging of our first couple of Code Hawks competitions. And you can see how fatigue kind of sets in for the judges after they've been doing it for, you know, 12 hours straight, right? They, humans will make mistakes. They will forget that, oh, this actually is similar to something else out there. Oh, these should have been grouped together. Oh, they didn't read it thoroughly enough. And the judging process is very intense, right? It's not like you show up. You spend a day and you're out. Sometimes this is week, a weeks long process, right? Sometimes it's as intense as the audit itself, right? Uh, and you have to get things right and you have to have all the, all the context of the code base. So humans make a lot of mistakes. Uh, we've seen that across every platform. So AI, like doing auto judging will probably not happen anytime soon. But if it ever does happen, it will be once it performs better than humans. But for now, it's just, uh, judge suggestions, if you will, which have been really helpful. Yeah, I think that's a good way to go about it. I think anything other than that, it becomes extremely dangerous. It's kind of like a, just a, a helpful way to keep judges on track, so to speak. Yeah, definitely. And you corrected yourself a little bit, a little while ago, from auditors to security researchers. So what are your thoughts on the security review versus audit nomenclature? I'm definitely in line with, with Spearbit's mentality. Um, uh, I love the post that they put out about it. That was great. Spearbit, put, for those of you who haven't seen it, Spearbit put, put out this long post about how they want things to be called security researchers, security reviews, as opposed to audits. I agree. I think the engineers should be called security researchers or security engineers as opposed to auditors for a lot of reasons. However, I think there are, I do understand some of the 
arguments for why to call it an audit. For example, like a competitive audit doesn't really feel like a competitive security review. It really feels like a competitive bug hunt, but eh, competitive bug hunt sounds weird. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm more in the line of security researcher, security review. I think security review is a much better, much better name. And I will be actually teaching that in my upcoming course that it's called security review. I think that should be the default. The thing that sucks is that normies don't know that. And they go, we want a smart contract audit. And that's going to be really hard to change anytime soon. Why do you think it's important to choose a one name or the other? Why do you think that holds any meaning? Yeah, I th great question. So I, I think it's really important because right now when you hear audit, you think, okay, this is a guarantee that my taxes are good, or this is a guarantee that my money is good, or I pass these legal requirements or something. And a security review, a smart contract or a smart contract audit, if you will, holds no such promise. It's not a guarantee your code is bug free. It's not a guarantee you have no issues. It's a guarantee of nothing. And I feel like the term audit kind of holds this connotation that it's Oh, it has been re reviewed and is good and is solid, which that is not the case at all. I feel like security review gives that much more, much, it's, it's just much more accurate. It's, that's what it is. It's a review of the code base for security. It's not a guarantee of anything. It's not, it doesn't promise anything. And I, I think the community that a lot of the, the non-security people, they see this code has been audited and they go, awesome. That means it's safe to use. If somebody said the code has been security reviewed, somebody might go, does that mean it's safe? They might think twice about using it, which is what we want, but that's probably not what the protocol wants. They like the term audit because if a normie hears the term audit and they think that's safe to use, they jump in. Anyways, I, I feel like, it's a better term and it's more integral uh, because it's it's saying what it really is more than than the assurance that the term audit gives. So I do think it's important. Do you think that this device within the industry of some people calling it an audit, some people calling it a security review might be doing more of a disservice to the industry rather than a service because wouldn't that confuse a lot of clients and a lot of potential customers like, oh, should I get an audit or should I get a security review? Are they the <laughs> same thing? Wouldn't that be kind of shooting ourselves in the foot? Should we, how do we, you know, approach this? Because I think from a customer perspective, having all these words tossed around when everything is already so confusing, it's even worse. So if that, if one name is not like, you know, chosen as the de facto name soon rather than later, wouldn't this be even worse for the industry? I think maybe, to be honest, I think maybe. Uh, yeah, maybe. And, you know, this is why these conversations are happening, right? We're trying to figure this out. Uh, but I would also kind of push back on that. And, and I would say, oh, just I wouldn't want us to make a decision as an industry. Oh, let's just pick one so that we don't have multiple terms. I think that's a bad argument for why we should stop having these discussions. I think these discussions are important. Yes, it's probably good if we pick one and run with it. But no, I don't think like, come on, let's just pick one. Like, I don't think that should be the, the rationale to, to make a decision here. Yeah, my big worry is that they become segmented terms. And some people decide to sell audits and some people decide to sell security reviews. From my perspective, the ones selling security reviews are probably going to be the more the more noble ones, right? But the people selling audits are going to be the let's not name them uh, kind of auditing firms. Yeah, I think everyone knows what I'm talking about. And I, I don't know what you're talking about. What are you talking about? No, no, no comment. Um, uh, we'll see. Uh, to be honest, we'll see. So, so you know, we we use the terminology security review a lot, but on our website right now, it says like request an audit because uh, the thing that's hard is for us. You know, if we say request a security review protocols are gonna be like, what the hell is that? And not click the button, right? So I, I think 
to be honest, I, th I think it's difficult. So the, one of the first things, so I have a video that I send all of our clients first video we send them and it says, what is a smart contract audit? And the first thing I say is I go, a smart contract audit is a security review. First thing I say to, to hopefully make it, make them aware of, of the better terminology. Yeah. So it's going to be a bit of a ride until we unmerge yeah. the waters, I think. Right. And going back to what we were discussing before of starting Cypher and starting code hawks, some people might think it's a bit contradictory to start an auditing form and a contents platform, right? Because they're different sides of the coin in a way, even though they're supposed to be used in conjunction. But why did you, I, I know you already touched on this, but I feel it's uh, important to dive deeper into why do both? Because some people say, oh, auditing firms are a lot better, or auditing firms are a lot worse, or contest platforms are the way to go, or they suck. So why, why are you doing both? Yeah, so again, What's, what's the question we've been asking since day one, right? What do we need? What do we need in Web3? And we think that we need both. We need both private audits and competitive audits. What do we need? Well, why? Okay. Competitive audits have been showing phenomenal results. More bugs get reported. You know, one could argue maybe that's because they're incentivized for more bugs to get reported because you get paid if you submit bugs. So... But at the same time, they get very poor, or this is subjective. This is very subjective. Um, I would argue they, they don't give as good of consultative advice. Um, whereas in a traditional audit, you can give feedback on the architecture, on the test suite, um, on a ton of things. We've been able to, you know, part in some of our audits, we'll literally make a, a pull request to the code base to add like invariant tests or fuzz tests or whatever you want to call them. You can't really do that in a competitive audit. So we think the future is both. And so recently at DeFi Security Summit, I think a couple months ago, there was this panel, like it was like competitive audit versus private audit. And sparks were kind of flying. Um, both sides sounded like they were saying, mine's better, yours is worse. And we think both are good, both are important. One would, I think it's, it's almost weird to not have both, uh, I would almost kind of argue, right? Like, uh, if you think one side is better, then are you saying you don't want your competitive auditors to do private audits as well? Like, um, see, the thing is tough is because a lot of private audit, or excuse me, a lot of competitive auditors, they'll, they'll do the competitive audit thing, they'll go build a brand, and then they'll go do solo audits where they make a lot more money, right? Um, uh, I want them to be successful. I want them to do that, right? I want people to be successful. I want security researchers to get paid for the good work that they do. I want to give them every option to do that. And again, it goes just, I mean, really the long and short of it is, is what do we need? What do we need Web3? We need as much damn security as we can get. So we think there's a lot of ways we can improve the competitive audits. So we launched Codox and we're going to continue to work on it to, um, make sure the security researchers get the opportunities that they deserve, that they need to be successful and do a lot of great work. And then obviously, uh, more importantly, continue to, to secure these protocols um, with these competitive audits, because the other thing is they do get phenomenal results. And right now, a lot of the conversations that we have is a lot of protocols still are nervous of them. They still don't understand them. The question we always get is, okay, how do we guarantee we're going to get top quality people? How do we know that we're not going to get a bunch of like fudders who are going to like yell about our protocol and, and say our code base is terrible and never use this? How do we know that this, that, the other thing? Um, and there's a lot of concern and we want to bring even more volume to these competitive audits. Um, and yeah, we think ultimately you should do both. You should do a private audit and a competitive audit. There's a lot of different ways that you can set up a competitive audit platform, right? Um, we have some that put more emphasis on high, more critical findings. We have others that are more thorough for vulnerabilities. 
Do you think there is room for experimentation of other types of competitive other platforms to come and explore different incentive models? Would you encourage that? What are your thoughts on things that could be tried that haven't yet been tried? Do you have those kind of discussions within the team as well? Oh yeah, all the time. And then like, you know, in the Discord, we'll talk about this stuff too. Um, on that note, I will say stay tuned for some stuff that we're going to come out with uh, soonish. So yeah. Oh, the, a lot of teasing coming coming up absolutely, this time. Absolutely. So the, again, the question is, what do we need? What do we need? What do we need? So that's literally, we're drilling that. Like what is, like I, I'm, I'm not... This is actually what happens whenever a rec news post drops. I look at it, I read it, and I go, fuck, what, what did I need to do to prevent this from happening? What video did I need to make? What blog did I need to make? Who did I need to get this out to? And so we're asking that. We're just constantly asking that. What do we need? What do we need? What do we need? What do we need? And exactly to your point, one of the things that we need is to tease or play with a new smart contract security process or framework. And that's something that we are working on right now. So yes, uh, okay. people should experiment with new models. Absolutely. Well, Follow Cyphern at, at Cyphern Audits on Twitter. And because uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have a pretty big announcement when uh, when that new model comes out. Uh, if we're okay, working okay. on one, if, if we're working on one. Oh, okay, allegedly. Yeah, yeah, okay, no, 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 we are. We, we are. But yeah, <laughs> follow us on Twitter. <laughs> uh, could, we, could we get like a, a timeline? Like, are we no. talking no. a month, two no months, no. two, two, two years? I already, no gave, I already gave too many timelines by giving the, the timeline for the security course. I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have done that because now, now I'm on the clock. Now people are going to be. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm on the clock. I can edit it. I can, I can nah, you know, because I mean, it's probably going to be like a month before I, actually it's going to be like a month before I put this out. So I, I better hurry up. No, no, you're, um, you're good. I already actually gave timelines uh, not so secretly elsewhere, so it's okay. No, I mean, I better hurry up and post this. Like, oh, sooner yeah, than you better. I yeah. thought I would. Although, shop, otherwise, shop. you're not going to be on the clock. Yeah, like, <laughs> get to work, dude. <laughs> Beyond the, the security sphere of things, are there any things that you're excited about in the crypto world? Things that you look up for, like things that uh, you think should be top of mind for anyone in this industry? Yeah, a bunch of stuff. So I'm always looking for, okay, what's the real yield, right? What are what are financial products that actually create yield and that are not just kind of silly liquidity mining, kind of like fake tokens, mixing with fake tokens to make more fake tokens? What, what Where's the real yield? And we're seeing this rise of tokenized assets or, or real world assets, whatever you want to call them. And to me, that's incredibly exciting. And I want to see more of that stuff. Um, Chainlink CCIP recently came out. Uh, really excited to see more cross-chain applications, cross-chain Japs doing doing whatever they did uh, they want to do. But yeah, the the biggest, most interesting things for me are like real real assets. We've seen a couple of products uh, protocols doing sort of like wrapped T bills, which is really exciting to me. Having permissionless permissionless access to uh, T bills is something that's really interesting. But yeah, more more real yield, uh, liquidity uh, LSTs are obviously kind of really hot right now. Um, I'm expecting those to continue to be hot. Um, but yeah, for me, it's it's DeFi. It's DeFi stuff, right? Outside of the security realm. Because for me, again, it goes back to, okay, well, why do I care about all this stuff being secure? And it's because of all this really cool DeFi stuff that's happening. That's why I care. Because there's all this really amazing innovation happening. Yeah, I think the real world assets trend that's going up right now, it's going to be like a precedent to what we want to see like on a long term of how actual you know real assets go into the blockchain so i think that's something that's really um it's kind of like setting the precedent to how those systems can be integrated in a way that makes sense because there's so many ways that you can screw this up you know in a lot of different points so it's it's interesting to watch all the ways that this is being brought to life for sure um, but you know, it's a, it's a lot to keep track of in the crypto sphere. There's so many projects coming out every day, you know, 
in so many different areas. It's kind of like an endless sea of things to keep track of. So how do you manage to do that while having all this stuff going on in your life? Um, to me, it's par for the course, um, to be honest. How are you going to be in Web3 and not know about the coolest stuff that's happening in Web3? I don't know. I feel like it's, you know, I have my, my deep work hours and then I have my hours where I catch up on, on what's interesting. But when I'm focused, I'm focused, you know, but when I go for a walk to the gym, I listen to a podcast, right? Or I read a book or something. Um, Any podcast you would recommend? Besides mine, obviously, because I don't uh, obviously play. proof of podcast. You gotta listen to proof of podcast. So, uh, scraping bits is is very solid. Uh, oh I, hell yeah! Yep, yeah, Degachi's been doing great work there. Um, the uh, I'm a I, I do listen to Bankless on occasion. I listen to Unchained podcast with Laura Shin um, on occasion. Um, Darknet Diaries for more security minded folks is phenomenal. It's not Web3 per se, but it is uh, phenomenal. Th those are some of the podcasts that I that I listen to. Yeah, cool. I feel like podcast is a great way to kind of keep track of things and Definitely. consume content in a time-efficient manner. Yeah. So how does a day in the life of Patrick look, looks like to get, you know, all those, all those things <laughs> done? Um, Recently, it's not been as good, but um, I'll say what, what it normally should be. So you wake up between between 5 and 6.15, and you have some breakfast. Then you get on your computer, and last night, you wrote down your task for the morning, so you already know what you're going to be doing. You spend maybe, maybe two to three hours just kind of in a deep work state which is phenomenal. And that deep work state is going to be, it's either going to be coding something, it's going to be researching something, it's going to be auditing something, or security reviewing something, whatever. Then you'll jump onto a couple meetings, perhaps, maybe a couple calls, hopefully not too many calls, the fewer the better. Um, which is why a lot of the times people will be like, hey, you want to do a podcast with me or something? And I'll be like, no, I'm busy. Uh, because the fewer the better. I wouldn't know who, I, I wouldn't know who these people are. <laughs> um, no, but I, I was telling somebody earlier, I was like, no, no, I promised him like months ago. I got I to gotta show up for this. Um, but uh, then I will have hopefully, you know, another few hours of solid deep work. Well, then I'll go to the gym and then I'll come back. And normally post gym is when I have my best sessions. Like I'll usually have like a five hour deep work session, which is great. And then I'll have dinner, maybe have another couple hours, a uh, couple hours of deep work and then go to bed. Uh, and that's really the, the routine. Nothing, nothing fancy. It's really get up, work, gym, work, sleep. And then every once in a while I go on a date with my girlfriend. So that's pretty much it. I see, I see. Yeah, just a regular, regular life. Um, so that begs the question, how is your bicep so big? <laughs> doing regular stuff? Oh, dude, I, I've been sick this week, so I haven't been able to go to the gym. And I'm like, I feel like I'm wasting away right now. Um, oh no! <laughs> you just go to the gym. How did that happen? <laughs> uh, you just go to the gym five days a week. That's it. You know, uh, find a find a uh, workout routine that works for you. I love CrossFit. I love the camaraderie. I love going to the gym and yelling at people and be like, "You can do it! <laughs> Come on!" And like, you can really undo that in CrossFit. You can't do it at the regular gym. So find a workout routine that works for you. Five days a week is plenty. Eat eat plenty of protein. Go talk to a nutritionist. I, uh, I'm definitely not the right person to talk to for gym and nutrition advice because uh, I'm pretty dumb about it. I go to the gym, I do whatever they tell me to do, and then I leave. You just follow the instructions. Yep, that's it, which is great because I'm like, my brain is too busy with other shit. So go to the gym. Yeah, I yeah. don't have to think for an hour. It's it's phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I noticed that the auditing term kind of is nicked up on you just before. And when you were mentioning the... Uh, you know when you're doing audits or security yep. reviews and it's a it's a sneaky one right it is i think you know even that you're trying to get rid of it it's like catchy so i think that's something to keep in mind you know no. um catchy catchy things have their their way to mm -hmm. to just remain part of everyday life it's a it's a um, lot shorter term too so in conversation it's a lot harder to be like security review audit yeah security review um audit security i review. i i saw some people throwing around the security tour 
kind of term, which yep. is kind of interesting. Securator. Um, yeah, it's a it's an interesting in between that it's probably not going to mean anything to anyone nope. outside of the industry. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's fun and in its own right, you know, it has some future maybe. Um, yeah, man, it's been a pleasure to have you here. I was super excited to talk to you. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to have you here. Like I said before, you were responsible for my onboarding to the industry. So thank you so much for making the time. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for jumping in Web3. We need a lot more people like yourself in here. So thank you for doing what you're doing and keep grinding. Thank you. Thank you.